Welcome to today's webinar, Best RF Design and Layout Practices. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today, Ernie Froering, Field Application Engineer at EMA Design Automation, and Amit Ball, Chief Revenue Officer at Sierra Circuits. Today's agenda and what you will learn is PCB stack up materials, impedance matching, types of RF traces, via stitching and ground planes, and power supply decoupling. Amit will now get started on the presentation for today's webinar. Thank you all for your attention and now over to you, Amit. Okay, thanks. Tell me if you can see my screen. Oh, you have to stop here. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Thanks, Nantha. Let me share. There it is. Can you see it? Yep. You're all good. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'm very excited about today's webinar. And I think uh, we have uh, wonderful basic information as well as uh, good demo later and you know all of it should be uh, very very impactful to your day-to-day -day PCB practices and please don't forget to ask questions uh, because that's how we all learn from each other and if you have a webinar that you want another topic for another topic you want a webinar on please also uh, don't hesitate to mention that in the in the comments or the or the questions so Today, I, we're talking about, I'm starting off with hybrid stack ups. I'm seeing more and more of that in our uh, everyday orders. And hybrid stack ups come with advantages, but they also come with some, hey, you should be aware of uh, type of things. So we'll discuss some of the techniques, design techniques, as well as manufacturing and fabrication techniques um, uh, for hybrid stack ups. Okay. So how do hybrid stack ups uh, really benefit um, you know, your RF design? So people do it because you know, it ensures proper controlled impedance, uh, solid return paths for your RF signals. And you know, it also really gives you the best of both worlds, which is you have a stack up optimized for the electrical performance of your board. So if you want to minimize your signal losses uh, and your attenuations, you know, you can opt in for low DKDF materials, um, specifically on just the layers you need them, you know, on your RF layers. So this basically turns into a hybrid stack up and the other layers can be, you know, regular FR4 um, and, you know, like a 370HR or any other kind of material like a Ventec or anything standard. And so what you're getting is the lowest cost possible stack up and sometimes uh, even just a better better stack up for manufacturability. So hybrid stack ups definitely uh, make sense. Um, now, what should you be aware of and, and how sh and what are the considerations uh, to build a hybrid stack up? So first, from an electrical standpoint, when choosing your materials, you know, Think about your frequency range, your rise times, and what kind of dielectric constant you want to be around. So in, in you just give an example, you know, up to 30 gigahertz, you should probably have a, a DK of around 3 to 3.5 and a loss tangent, you know, between what's mentioned. And this will help you uh, get a better performing board overall. Now, from a standpoint of uh, reliability and manufacturability, you do have to worry about the CTE mismatches in a stack up. So when you're doing, let's say, for example, sub lambs and you're filling those vias with a non-conductive epoxy, the CTE at that point is different than the rest of the materials around it. And you could have point of failure at these areas. So you want to be careful of that. And a, a very good technique uh, you know, if you're using materials that flow well, is just to resin fill your vias. It saves steps, it saves cost, and it's, you know, kind of provides the same thing, which is reinforcement inside the via. 
You also want to make sure that the material you're picking has the proper dielectric spacing uh, that you need. So when we're calculating impedance, you know, how many options do we have for dielectric thicknesses in order to achieve what you, the overall thickness or let's say you have an impedance requirement uh, and or, you know, manufacturing requirement like a blind, uh, a laser drill blind via. So those things all come into play. And if you pick a material that has less dielectric options, you're, you're kind of, um, what's the right way to say it? You're, you're restricting your manufacturer to provide you the best possible solution for your electrical performance. Uh, so be careful about that. And then, you know, another technique is to group the signal layers uh, based on your operating frequencies. Uh, and then also RF signals, usually on external layers adjacent to ground planes, um, you can do a cap or core construction. So there's no question of uh, thicknesses varying uh, from lot to lot or after uh, lamination. That's a very normal uh, hybrid type of solution. And I'll show you an example later. So here are some of the materials I mentioned, um, FR4 as being a part of a hybrid stack up. Um, you know, FR408 uh, HR has a little bit better properties than, you know, uh, a regular FR4. So just be aware of that. There's also PTFE materials like Rogers has uh, Teflon. And then there's also ceramic filled PTFEs um, like uh, Rogers Duroids. And there's a whole slew of ARC materials as well and uh, high speed uh, RF materials. So now be aware that when you're picking the different materials, like a, some cores from Isola, um, like, a, like an Astra or an iSpeed, they also provide dielectric uh, materials that you know kind of go with the material properties of the cores. So you absolutely can also choose the prepregs that correspond to the cores that you're, you're selecting. So just be aware of that. Um, an example like a Rogers uh, 4350, there's a 4450 prepreg that goes with that. Um, so, uh, you know, just it helps with manufacturability and electrical performance. Now, if you have a Rogers 5880, 99% of the time it's just a two layer circuit board. So you don't have to really worry about uh, bonding that, um, you know, to any other layer. But if you do have to bond a 5880, just know that the bond plies out there are limited in thickness. I think it only comes in one thickness, actually. So just be aware of those decisions prior to you deciding. And of course, work with your manufacturer. So some things that can, you know, be uh, an, a challenge in manufacturing, and we have our manufacturing engineers uh, as well to answer questions at the end. So please ask a bunch of questions. But basically, what I think is, you know, could be challenging and is challenging is if you select a material, first of all, that um, is not good for the drill size or the drill cycle you're doing, be it a mechanical drill or a laser drill. If you have a laser drill, for example, PTFE might be hard to laser. Um, and so you have to be aware of how that material lasers, um, not just the glass reinforcement that you choose, but the actual material itself. So PTFE is notorious for being very soft and a little bit more difficult to work with in that regard. Now, that being said, no matter which materials you pick, if you have a hybrid stack up, you really have to worry about scaling of the material. So you could have misalignment between subs. And so what we spend a lot of time on is manufacturing subs, uh, measuring the scaling, and then therefore having um, the data of how this would scale in the future. And if a company doesn't have this data in their database of how things should scale, uh, then it becomes, you know, you must run a first article prior to the actual build in order to collect the scaling information. And we do that too. Sometimes the stack ups are so unique that there really is nothing else like it. And so we have to just run a first article to collect the scaling information for the further on build. So be aware that when you have a hybrid stack up, you have some constraints on the manufacturing side. So number one, when you have hybrid stack ups, you have to worry about scaling. So the manufacturer might have to run an FA. Uh, second, uh, you, the manufacturer has to uh, understand 
the drilling, the proper drilling parameters and whether these materials can be laser drilled. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, just keeping track of um, the material movement or the scaling and, and to get you what you're looking for, especially in like a class three design. We have a quick video I can show you um, as I run through this discussion, but basically what we talked about uh, is, you know, seeing inside the material, seeing how the material moves um, and, to, and to then properly scale materials and drills. Um, you would scale possibly an outer layer uh, for an HDI board, but if you're doing a cap construction, you don't really have that luxury. Um, so there's trade-offs for cap constructions. Um, but knowing the, how the material moves is really the key thing. And so that was, the video there was an example of that. So just very quickly, some stack ups. Uh, so here's an example stack up using, you know, 4350 and 370 HR uh, materials. This has a sub of 4350, which would absolutely scale different and press out different than the 370 HR. So this is an example of uh, a stack up you must run first article for. And then there's, I have another example, which is more of a balance where you have a 4350 on the outside layers, which is gonna be a cap construction and then 370 HR all in the center. So, uh, you know, a little bit easier to predict the scaling on. So that's all I had. I'm gonna pass it over to Ernie who has some good uh, demonstrations that he can share with you. Ernie, you're up. We can't hear you if you're talking. I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> Impedance matching is important for both digital and RF analog circuits. For digital circuits, reflections can distort the signal resulting in data transfer errors. Impedance matching is a crucial aspect of RF PCB design as it ensures efficient power transfer and signal integrity between RF components, transmission lines, and antennas. Proper impedance matching helps minimize signal reflections and maximize power transfer and optimize system performance. Characteristic impedance, which is sometimes referred to as Z0, refers to the inherent impedance of a transmission line or the impedance seen by a signal propagating along the transmission line and is determined by the physical dimensions and properties of the transmission line, like its width, thickness, dielectric materials, and relative permeativity of the substrate material. And I'll show this in a short demo afterwards. When the characteristic impedance of the transmission line matches the impedance of the source and load, known as impedance matching, it reduces signal reflections, maximizing power transfer, and maintaining signal integrity. Okay, I'm gonna show a quick demonstration. And for this, I'm gonna use Microwave Office, which is a cadence tool that we represent at EMA for RF circuit design and analysis. It allows me to create circuitry in a schematic to be able to take that schematic and also be able to import data from a, from a PCB itself or to export the schematically created structure back to the PCB. We also have the ability to do simulations in the, of the 3D structure and be able to verify the, the copper analysis of that. So this is what I'm gonna quickly show you in, the, in my demonstration. Okay, so for characteristic impedance, what I've done is I've taken and created a very simple schematic. This schematic is just a a, 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 a circuit align, you know, a, a, a basically a basic circuit, and I'm creating a port at this side and a port at this side, and I'm going to measure the characteristics of this 400 mil circuit. I'm using a stack up for the simulations, which which are which matches. Um, which uh, which matches the uh, Rogers material type setup, okay? So this schematic, this is what we call a closed form simulation. I'm not actually looking at the structure, copper structure to do the simulation, but I'm just using this as individual elements. And AWR has a wide range of elements that can be used for simulation. 
if I look at the results in my graph here, and I'm gonna sim what I'm gonna do is simulate, okay? And then look at the results of my graph. Oh, excuse me, there we go. Okay, what I'm showing you is a Smith chart. Now Smith chart has been a way to be used to, to do impedance matching and impedance calculations since the 1930s. Basically what it does is this particular Smith chart is set up for uh, 50, 50 ohm impedance. So the line, if you're the line at the center means that your circuit matches that. The reason I'm seeing a circle is because the this, this circle represents, I did a sweep from two gigahertz to 20 gigahertz. And the, so they're actually, the structure has different impedances depending on what the frequency is. I've also set this one up to do what's called tuning. So for tuning, you can see I can change the width of my trace, I can change the dielectric constant, or I can change the height of this, basically the thickness of the substrate. And you can see here that by changing these numbers, I actually can change the impedance characteristics across the frequency range. It's also possible for me to be able to go and create a frequency range which matches 50 ohms across the entire uh, entire spectrum from two gigahertz to 20 gigahertz by being able to shirk the, sweep that circle into it. So this is just a quick demonstration showing impedance matching and showing the use of AWR's tuning capabilities to do that. So you can see the number, by the way, the value was 10. The value was 10 for the substrate length thickness. Okay, so now, by the way, I, uh, expanding on, on uh, the uh, stack up information, uh, some of the information that you saw that Amit gave was based on a webinar that, that CR Networks did a couple of weeks ago on stack up materials. If you want more information, you can go to that one. Okay, let's talk about RF trace design. For effective RF trace design, aim for the shortest trace lengths to lessen attenuation. Routing RF traces requires special attention to the distance between the lines. Don't run RF and nominal traces parallel to prevent interference. I sometimes say the copper becomes more and more important the higher the frequency is. Ground planes are necessary for signal return paths, including solids, continuous copper reference planes on adjacent layers that shield the RF signal from noise coupling and radiative losses. And Avoid placing test points on traces because it disrupts the competence matching. When it comes to transmission lines, you'll typically see designs using microchips, strip lines, and copay and wavelengths. Avoid sharp rate turns on the traces if possible. You'll get better performance with gently curved bends. And if you cannot avoid right angle bends, use metering to, as shown here. Microchip transmission lines are popular and, and commonly used in RF PCB design because they are simple and easy to fabricate. These transmission lines have signal trace on the top and a return path or a ground plane uh, at the bottom. A dielectric material separates the signal trace and the ground plane. The trace width and spacing along with the dielectric constant of the substrate material are carefully chosen to achieve the desired characteristic impedance as we show, have shown in the demonstration. Strip line transmission lines, the signal trace is embedded between two parallel ground planes, giving the transmission line a symmetric shape and offer two return paths for the signal. The signal trace is routed on the inner layer of the board and is surrounded by dielectric layers that separate the trace signal from the reference planes. Strip line transmission lines increase signal integrity and are frequently used in RF PCB designs for better isolation or impedance control is essential. A coplanar waveguide transmission line has a signal trace and two return planes on either side of the trace signal on the same layer. The dielectric material isolates the trace signal from the return planes. Coplanar waveguide transmission lines are widely used in RF PCB design 
because they offer excellent isolation between adjacent transmission lines and minimize electronic interference effects. And they allow wider trace widths for lower losses because the impedance changes. It is frequently utilized in RF PCB designs for low insertion loss, good isolation, and ease of fabrication are crucial considerations. For optimal performance, place a dedicated ground plane directly beneath each RF layer. This reduces electrical noise, prevents interference, and minimizes crosstalk between components. Keep the ground plane solid throughout most of the layout. However, allow exceptions under connectors or antennas. This approach balances signal integrity and functionality. Divide your ground planes into digital and analog sections. This separation further reduces interference, ensuring clean signals for both types. Implement stitching vias to connect ground planes across layers, enhancing return current slow impedance, but avoid using vias to be route traces between layers if possible. In other words, connect to the ground plane, but don't don't it avoid if you can changing layers with any RF signal. Via fences are important in coplanar designs and opt for maximum vias between top and inner ground planes in general. You can see here a picture of a coplanar line with the via traces using as a shield. For stitching vias, place them less than 1 20th of the signal wavelength apart. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you another demonstration showing some of these properties of coplanar design and stitching vias. Okay, so what I've set up here is I've set up a test schematic. You can see right here. That schematic has a coplanar, coplanar 400 mil, mil coplanar trace. And I'm looking again at the port this the beginning part and the ending part of this. This is a coplanar model. So what I can do is I can simulate this particular circuit and we're using a closed form model and simulating a, how it would act as a coplanar signal within a design, okay? I then created a circuit like this, which is that same coplanar circuit, except instead I extract it using a stack up to a to basically an EM structure, electromagnetic structure, which I use for simulation. So you can see here, this is what it looks like when it's extracted. This is the 2D display. You've got the copper that's acted as, as you know as the shield and the copper on the other side, and here's the trace going between them. If I look at this document in 3D, what you'll see is then there's the design and I batted a ground plane. And so I could see, see end of the design itself. Okay, so that's what it looks like for the scissor. I then set up the same, same circuit, but what I did is I added vias onto the coplanar area. I wanna see what the difference is that the via stitchings add. So let me go and look at that circuit here. That's the 2D display. Okay, and here is the 3D display. Oops, 3D display. What you can see now is there are the vias. So you see what I've done is I've added vias onto the structure and you can see them here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a simulation of all three of these examples. And if I look at the graph, you'll see this is what it looked like in terms of the response of the coplanar signal, okay? And then what I'm doing is I'm looking at what's called a S-parameter model of it. So you can see here that there, there is some resonance associated with the coplanar structure, but it's not, it's not going that bad. If I take the display which had the, um, if I add on the display which had the, the actual, simulation of the 3D structure, you'll see something interesting happening here. In other words, here's that same display I had before my ideal coplanar circuit. But when I do this simulation, so somewhere a little over eight 
gigahertz, there's a, there's a resonance that's created. This resonance is created because of, between my power, between the plane that's used around my coplanar circuit and the plane below, there's a resonance between those, those two ground planes. So what I do is I add on, I go into my third example, which is with the simulation this, that's with the stitching vias. So the stitching vias now connects those two planes directly and I don't have any resonance problem. And you'll see if I turn off the display of the top one here, you'll see that this is my perfect, my ideal one. And this is the simulation of the one actually with the copper plane done over. So you can see here the power of doing simulation to be able to verify circuits. And as I, as I told you, this example is showing designing and creating an EM structure. I can also take EM structures directly from a printed circuit board and simulate them as well. So let me go back with the demonstrate with the talk here. Okay. So let's talk about power supply to coupling, because this is important. And it turns out it's important in both analog and circuit digital circuits as well. For power supply decoupling, pairs of capacitors are recommended. When this, when I first ran into this, I didn't quite understand why. Okay. But what happens is the higher value capacitor filters low frequency noise and stores energy. The lower value capacitor targets high frequency noise filtration. So they each have their purpose. Okay. For the optimal performance, operate capacitors at their self-resonant frequency, okay? It turns out that capacitors are not just pure capacitors. They have inductance associated with them, and they have resistance associated with them. The inductance also comes from what's called an, what's called an inductive loop, right, with the return point loop. So select capacitors with an SRF uh, matching noise, which matches the noise frequency for effective noise management. I mentioned the thing about, uh, about it, loops, return current loops. So if you look at the return current loops, what you'll find is this is a very bad way of, of routing a, a current, a uh, resistive current. So it's important that the place of filter caps is filter cap vias as close as possible to the mounting pad and into and into each other. This reduces the inductive return ground loops and duplicate vias will further reduce the inductance. Okay, so you see here, this one has a high inductance because the trace is so thin. This one has a high inductive because of the, because of the return path loop is going all the way on the ground plane back to, to the power plane here. This one is better because the two trace two leas are closer together, and so the return loop is smaller. But this is the best because the return loop is smaller, and the induction of the, the inductive forces of the both vias um, reduce the in total inductance of of the particular trace. Okay, in, in creating this presentation. I use the following references, okay? I'd, uh, and uh, so I, I refer you to these locations if you want more information. There's also, there's many websites which talk about RF design techniques that I recommend you look at. Okay, well, thank you very much. That completes my presentation. So now, uh, Based on what we have seen, do you have any questions? All right, Ernie, there are some specific questions to your presentation. Okay. Um, in one of the slides, it's the person Swastik is asking why were S21 and S12 not identical in, for the trace without via? Shouldn't it be the same? Okay. Uh... It, what I found, it, it should be it, it should be the same, but I've found that there are differences and I, I honestly can't explain what the differences are. I didn't realize I was showing it. I usually just only use S21. If I did S12, I was doing it by mistake. So, 
also I would, you know, uh, ask whether it was the, which example it was. In the ideal case, it should probably be the same. What is, how, how do you determine how much of CT mismatch is tolerable? I, I don't know. Okay. That has to be specified by the customer. The way we need to answer this is the minimum CTE mismatch. Okay. okay. That is possible. And we have to choose the material. It's totally a function of material. Okay. So which is the material which has the least? So for each material, we can basically draw a table. Now this mismatch is on two sides. One is the XY and another is the Z, Z direction. So what we need to basically display here is for the various materials, what is the, is the CTE mismatch in the X direction and what is it in the Y direction? And we can basically make a ordered table of this one, descending uh, uh, or ascending basically. The mismatch, the minimum is the best, okay? So if you go to our, uh, I mean, actually one can go to the, these things and uh, if you bring in the specifications of anything, then I can tell you in the Z direction, there are two specifications, okay? There is a percentage change percentage variation over a temperature range for the Z direction. Why is, why is it recommended to route RF traces on the external layer of an hybrid stack up? It would seem that sometimes you want to sandwich RF traces inside. See, the, the key point here is very simple. The speed of travel of electromagnetic waves is the highest on the outer traces because the effective dielectric constant is the lowest on the outer traces. Okay. In a hybrid stack up, generally the material which is there between layer one and two is a very high frequency material, like you know, Rogers or you know, etc. etc. That already has a, a lower dielectric constant like 3 or between 2 to 3. So the speed is high. And on top of it, you have air on top of that. So the effective dielectric constant even becomes less. So the speed becomes more. So for reducing the, the what you call as the propagation time, okay, it is always better to have the R. Another point here is very important to consider is that normally in, in very high frequency RF traces, okay, you generally use a, if you have a hybrid stack up, in general, there is a core. There is a core between layer one and two. So it's a core construction. In a core construction, why do we core construction? Because the width, the only dielectric height that comes into play is the width is the thickness of the core. And thickness of the core does not vary with the copper percentage. It remains the same. So you have a very stable thickness and very stable, therefore, the dielectric constant and, and the dielectric thickness and therefore very stable control impedance. And so it is better to route it on the outer layers. Okay. Any recommendation or rule of thumb for which type of weaving to use for high speed signals yeah definitely 108 so basically spread glass spread glass should be used for high speed signals plain and simple so 1086 is definitely preferable to 2116 or 33113 okay go further i don't know whether 3313 is uh, spread glass or not but spread glass we need to use okay for the last one in the data sheet of this, two different decays are specified. Which one should be used for calculation and what is the difference between them? Uh, frankly speaking, we need to ask the Rogers guy. Did we not ask the Rogers person in this seminar? I think we can send an inquiry to them. 
In my top layer, the RF trace width is 20 mil for 50 ohm impedance. On the same layer, we use digital signals with 50 ohm impedance. How much trace width do I need to say exactly the same? You can have different. For any single-ended impedance, on any copper layer, you can only have one geometry. You can't have two different geometries, okay? In coplanar ground, now, if you if you say that the RF trace is coplanar and the other is not coplanar, then, you know, you can do the both uh, calculations separately for 50 ohms. In coplanar grounded microstrips, how do you determine, wait a minute, go back, the pitch of the ground vias. It depends upon what is your maximum frequency or maximum wavelength or minimum wavelength. And you have to do it one lambda by four. Go further. Should the length of a trace be short, even if the impedance is well matched? A shorter trace is always better because overall, your delay will be less, signal delay. There is a propagation delay per unit length. And that, therefore, the entire delay of the signal is proportional to the length of the trace. So, therefore, you need to do that. The length, there's no point in unnecessarily increasing un the trace length unless you have to match in a group that all the propagation time in the whole group of those traces, control impedance traces, it has to be propagation delays have to be matched within to that one. So then the, you adjust the lengths, you, you, some lengths you shorten, some lengths you increase so that they are within e each other. Okay? All right. How to calculate the distance between the RF trace and the coplanar ground plane? Is the same thing. Is the gap. Okay? So coplanar ground plane, this should be how to calculate. You don't have to calculate. You need to specify that. And generally, you should not use a distance of less than 5 mils. Preferably 6 mils is better. Okay? All right. Go further. Do you always remove shoulder mask in RF traces? If so. Not in our, I mean, our RF traces, shoulder mask. Yes, why shoulder mask is, uh, you know, is, if it is a very extremely low loss and very high frequency RF, then in that case, those traces should not be shoulder mask. Why? Because the loss increases due to the shoulder mask. Generally, shoulder mask is not a very high frequency material. So it has a loss similar to what, you know, typical FR4 material has. And uh, your ma main dielectric has very low loss, so it basically kind of uh, you know nullifies some of that effect. Solder mask, extremely low loss RF, high frequency uh, requirements want that your solder mask should be removed. So what is the what should be the clearance between the solder mask edge? and the trace edge. Whatever is the manufacturability, couple of mils, okay? Two mils. I need to use a combined RF and digital board where FPGA needs to be on the same side as the RF circuitry. I also need micro VRs for FPGA fan off. What are the critical stack of features to achieve the best tolerance? and batch variation for the RF. What is CPWG defined impedance tracing? So I think it is coplanar wave guide. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, okay. To achieve, what are the critical stack of features? There is no critical stack of feature over here. 
is basically on that layer, you have to basically have the proper impedances. You want to have microvias, have it. So a stack of features, all that you need to do is, so FPGA can only be on the outer. So basically it's talking of the outer layer, top layer, let us put it this way. So you have both RF and digital board where the FPGA needs to be on the same side as the RF circuitry. On the same side, okay. Oh, you also need micro VRs. Okay. What are the circuit critical fields to achieve the best tolerance and batch variation for the RF CPW defined impedance traces? So that's all. RF CP uh, WG defined impedance traces should be on the uh, top layer, on the same layer as the you know RF circuitry and the FPGA is there. That's it. What is the minimum trace length required to achieve the impedance on the outer and inner layers? What he's trying to say is, this is what we call as the lambda by, there is a, somewhere there is some application note or some blog or something where we say that the trace length below which you can actually treat even the impedance traces not to be designed as for impedance traces and above that you need to do that. So there is a length defined and I think it's lambda by 10 or lambda by 6 or lambda by 8 or something. like that. So that, that basically is defined from that perspective. And whether it is the minimum or uh, inner or outer, you have to basically see what is the speed of the trace. Okay. Basically propagation delay how, 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 what is the signal? Lambda depends upon the speed. Hmm? You know that lambda is the speed divided by frequency. So frequency is the highest frequency content in the signal. So lambda comes from there. And the lambda, therefore, lambda by 10 or something, any 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 length which is any lambda by 12, or I thought it was lambda by 12. So any trace length which is less than lambda by 12 can possibly not be, uh, you can kind of uh, ignore the, you know, the, the impedance calculation, but not above it. So basically what you can taper it and all that stuff, the, okay. What is the minimum trace length required to achieve the impedance on the uh, same thing? I, I'm basically talking. So this is he's talking of the critical length, over there. not the word critical length, but the minimum. Okay, I need to implement a matching network in an RF trace, but the component pads are significantly larger than the trace width. So how do you mitigate reflections in this scenario? Component pads may be larger. So what you need to do is you need to put a, whatever your matching network is, you know, in order to reduce the reflection, that has to be as placed as close to the component as possible. So that the reflection, so the amount of the distance between the component pads and the, and the matching network pad is minimum. That's the way. There are certain applications that particularly mention that SRF of the capacitor series resonant frequency should be higher than the maximum frequency of operation. Now, this is a power integrity related question. We are talking of the decoupling capacitor, okay? the ceramic capacitor. Definitely it should be, uh, uh, it's not always true, so long as one is able to meet the target impedance of the power uh, line on which the decoupling capacitor is there, its life is okay, okay? 
would a VI impaired be better to reduce inductance and ground loop? Yeah, the, any additional interconnection will introduce a parasitic inductance. So VI impaired definitely will be better. Yes, answer is yes. When we have micro strip RF traces that are mask opened, Okay, that means there is no mask on top of that. That's what he's probably trying to say. We'll have surface finish on the trace during manufacturing. How do we ensure the RF signal impedance does not get impacted? So the surface finish which is there is such that it does not corrode the copper. Okay. And that's it. How do we ensure RF signal impedance does not get impacted? Yeah. So mask open. If there is a masking, then we basically calculate the impedance with the mask. Now, whether mask is to be put on the transmission lines, control impedance transmission lines, will depend upon whether it is having a significant impact on the loss, the entire loss on the, if it that is tolerable within budget, then you can mask it. If it is not tolerable, then you don't mask it. If you don't mask it, then you have to have a finish on top of the, you know, the gold uh, or tin, whatever it is, uh, you can have a tin finish over there and you can have a gold finish and you know, it is not supposed so that the copper is protected. So gold finish does not, gold finish on a trace does not affect the impedance because it is very thin and it really doesn't matter very much. Okay. The answer to this is that if the solder mass is tolerable so that the loss the insertion loss of the transmission line during its travel is within budget and is acceptable at the highest signal frequency that you have, then it then you should use solder mask. Otherwise, you should remove the solder mask and have a hard gold finish or something like that. Okay, go further. Renig finish, okay. What is preferred? VI stitching gap? Lambda by 20 or lambda by 10? Ah, lambda by 10 should be okay. I thought it was lambda by 4. Lambda by 10 should be okay. If you, it depends upon your lambda value. If the lambda value is so small, the lambda by 20 is not possible, then use lambda by 10. So whatever is the, okay, do the calculations, lambda by 20, lambda by 10, lambda by four. So out of that, whichever one is the best possible in terms of you have to have a spacing between the two, you know, you can't have uh, VRs just next to each other, okay? So it totally depends upon the lambda also. Should a filter like a pie filter be close to the antenna or close to the pin of the RF module? So basically there is a distance between the RF module and the antenna. And what is filter doing? Filter is trying to filter out a certain frequency that has to be transmitted on the antenna or received from the antenna. Therefore, pi filter should be close to the RF module and not to the antenna. Okay. That's fine. Thank you.